Taxes are at the root of the rioting in Boston today. But those scores of impromptu speeches in every section of the town give a clear indication of how far beyond taxes the resentment of the people has swollen. King's tyranny, the sons of liberty cried, send the lobster back soldiers home. As the day advances, it seems a miracle that no lives have been lost, no blood has been spilled in the riots so far, that the crowds are larger and the bumping, bruising incidents are increasing. We take you now to King Street, where Dick Joy is standing by at a position up. You are there. This is Dick Joy speaking to you from King Street, near the Custom House. Outside Murray's barracks, across the square, where a detachment of British troops is quartered, about 50 men have been standing for more than an hour, shouting at the soldiers inside and cursing and hurling snowballs at the building. All at once, as if by command from somewhere, the crowd came across the square, past our position here, and turned off King Street. At the moment, the street is deserted. Just a minute. What's this? Ah, dirty lobsters for sale or hire. I'm warning you, boy. I'll set your bleeding mouth. My lobster brains. What time you got here? Your captain knows my master money for the half. Oh, so that's who you are, eh? The barber's boy. And I know where you can find a dirty job, sir. Lobster back, sweeping up the street. Go on, get back, you funky master. My master won't have me back until I bring your captain's money for his half. Money, eh? So I'll give you money. Hold that lobster. Leave that boy alone. I'm not afraid. Let him come. This is what I do to lobsters. You sir, will give you medals now for beating boys? His captain owes my master money. I offered him a job so he could pay. The same job Sam Gray told him Friday, eh, bully boy? <laughs> <laughs> hey, bloody back. You want to earn a little extra money? <laughs> We're marching down the Boston train, son of the stupid king, with lobster bags and lobster brains and lobster everything. <laughs> Swine, you'll call a boy, will you? Stand back. I'll kill you with my hand. You taste lead first. Careful now. He's much as loaded. Clouding a boy, you haven't got the guts to fire. Let that try me, Yankee Where? Come on. We take the boy to Sam Adams. He clouded the barber's boy. You've seen him. I saw him for sure. I won't forget his face. Yeah, I'll change that ugly face. Just one step forward. Stop it, Alex. He's mad enough and fool enough to fire in spite of his orders. Now, come on. We have muskets of our own. You're no use to us dead. Come on. You'll hear from this tonight, bloody back. Just a minute, soldier. Soldier, I'd like to ask a question. This incident undoubtedly will be reported with others like it all over town to Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty. Everyone knows these incidents are only the beginning. Do you know where it will all end? Well, it appears our soldier is in no mood to talk with us. We take you now to Harlow Wilcox in the governor's office in the state house. Harlow Wilcox reporting. This is the governor's office in the state house. The two men you see have been in emergency conference most of the day. The man in uniform is Colonel Dalrymple, commanding the British troops in Boston. And the other gentleman is former Chief Justice Thomas Hutchinson, now acting governor of the colony. Minor local disturbances amount to rebellion. Now, I will not declare martial law, legally or otherwise. You're no longer Chief Justice. You're acting governor of this colony. Despite your opinion of people, Colonel, there are shrewd legal minds here, as in all American colonies. Men who would leap at the opportunity to show that I had labeled these petty brawls rebellion. Some province lawyers, like John Adams, I suppose. Don't underestimate John Adams. He's an able barrister. He's a traitor to the king. Not yet. But if we're not careful, he and others like him may be driven to it. No. I was thinking more of his cousin, Sam Adams, and of James Otis, and of the Sons of Liberty. Sam Adams and his drunken mob of this whole thing. You know it and I know it. Why don't you let me arrest him? Make martyrs of them, Colonel? Besides, how long do you think you could hold them? They have friends in every colony. Very well, Governor. You're the civil administration here. But Boston is seizing with violence and brawl. Now, you've told me what you won't do. What will you do? I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps if you withdraw all your soldiers from the streets, you couldn't mean that. 
Well, your soldiers are the source of all this irritation. You know that. I know this. My soldiers were sent here to keep the king's peace. That is our mission. Subject, of course, to the civil administration, Colonel. Governor, for the last time, I'm requesting you to grant me permission to command my soldiers to defend themselves. Permission for your soldiers to fire on the citizens? Your request is denied, Colonel. Very well, Governor. However, inasmuch as Boston is now in a state of rebellion and disorder, and inasmuch as I can find no civil administration competent to deal with the emergency, I must advise you that henceforth I will take any action I deem necessary to restore order and the King's peace. Colonel Dalrymple, I promise you, Colonel, any soldier who fires on a citizen of this colony will be tried in our civil courts on a charge of assault with a deadly weapon and attempt to commit murder. My soldiers will restore order to Boston, sir. Good day. Governor Hutchinson. Yes. It is said, sir, that your sympathies lie with England. Said by whom, Sam Adams? I am a civil servant of the king. I am also acting governor of this colony. Therefore, my loyalty is to the king, but my sympathies are with the people of Massachusetts. In these restless times, then, you feel such a divided allegiance is possible? It is possible only to a rational man. Sir, you spoke of your admiration for John Adams. Admiration is the wrong word. He's a good barrister. Too good sometimes for the king's best interest. Is that why you tried to appoint him Advocate General of the Admiralty? John Adams made a mistake when he declined that appointment. Sam Adams believes you made a mistake, Governor, when you accepted your appointment. This is no time to be discussing personalities. I have official responsibilities to attend to. You will excuse me. Grant Holcomb, at the south end of Boston, is standing by with Mr. John Adams. Come in, Grant Holcomb. Welcome reporting, and the wig gentleman coming up the street is Mr. John Adams, the eminent Boston barrister. He's one of the few men who still has the respect of both Whigs and Tories in this town of violent loyalties, and he's consented to a brief interview. I'm afraid it must be quite brief. I understand, sir. Your wife is ill, and you're anxious to get home to her as soon as you can. Now, with Boston in this sort of temper, I'm indeed anxious about all our wives and children. Mr. Adams, uh, what's happening in Boston today? What does it really mean? I think uh, what's happening here is the inevitable result of a long series of mistakes, mutual misunderstandings on the part of both England and the colonies. Then you don't agree with Governor Hutchinson when he says these are only petty brawls and minor local disturbances? If that's the governor's true opinion, I consider it to be another example of misunderstanding. Presumably we colonials are free men. You know that when I go through my own gate this evening, I'll be challenged by a British sentry. Free men, I suggest, are capable of policing their own communities. Is there any wonder that Pennsylvania's Mr. Benjamin Franklin wrote from London only the other day that he's been in constant panic since he heard of troops assembling in Boston? The British commander, Colonel Dalrymple, has said that your cousin, I, I'm quoting him now, he says that your cousin, Sam Adams, and his drunken mob are behind all this. Would you care to comment on that, sir? Well, as we all know, there are always uh, roustabouts and ruffians who'll join anything for the sake of a riot. And some of these have joined the so-called Sons of Liberty. An organization whose membership is principally composed of honest, sincere colonial citizens. Farmers, shopkeepers, laboring men. I, I must confess that my uh, cousin Sam and I disagree on many issues, including some of the activities of the Sons of Liberty. You see, he's a politician, I'm a barrister. Yes, I know, but just one more question. Uh, the colony, sir, uh, they petitioned London, have they not, uh, for the right to send colonial representatives to Parliament? We have indeed, repeatedly. Would you like to hear England's latest reply to our petition? I'd like to hear it very much, sir. From the new Prime Minister, Lord North himself. Pressed me so deeply I've committed it to memory. Lord North said, and I quote, The drunken ragamuffins of a vociferous mob are exalted into equal importance with men of judgment, morals, and property. I can never acquiesce in the absurd opinion that all men are equal. <laughs> Fire Oh, Sons of Liberty, more likely. I'm sorry, I really must go. I lose all sense of time when I'm on this subject. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. Adams. Now, we've just received word here that Mr. Adams' brother... Sorry. One last word. What's happening here in Boston is not casual or superficial. It's dreadful in its significance and implications. 
England's lack of understanding is rendering the colonial position untenable. Once American blood is shed, I fear... I fear it may be too late. Again, thank you, sir. Now, we've just received word that Sam Adams has been located at an inn in the north end of town, so we switch you there, Todd Hunter reporting. This is Todd Hunter. We're in a rear room in a north end tavern called the Salutation. Behind that closed door, we've been told Mr. Sam Adams is meeting with some of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, and we sort of hope that... Yes. Yeah. You want somebody? We were told Mr. Sam Adams is in that room. Well, maybe he is. We were told he might answer some questions. More than one Sam here. Maybe I got some answers for you. I'm Sam Gray. Oh, Sam Gray, the rope walker? That's right. I'm him. I'm the one that beat up them three lobster backs Friday and up. Oh, you're the one. Oh, excuse me. It's all right. I think I've had all I had to say about them three dirty lobster backs. Every time I think of it, it makes my... Oh, never mind. Oh. The reporter. Everything all right? Sam Adams, what's on your mind? Oh, excuse me. Yes, uh, Mr. Tremagan, Molyneux, Captain Mackin. <coughs> All gentlemen in the sight of their creator. Yes, and well. sons of liberty in the sight of men. Don't forget, uh, Sam Gray. Oh, our gladiator? <laughs> Who can forget Sam Gray? And those thumps he struck for liberty last Friday. His country won't forget him. Nor three English soldiers either, eh, Sam? That's right. I hope my country never forgets me, because <laughs> I'd bash those dirty lobster faces in. <laughs> Brick Church. Alex accomplished his mission. Yes. That would turn the North Shore out with fire bags and buckets. Governor Hutchinson, his Imperial Grace, will climb into his nice shirt and pull the bed clothes up over his head. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Adams, yes. the differences between you and Governor Hutchinson have been growing. I don't like pompous men. The governor claims his sympathies are with the people of Massachusetts. Hutchinson covets position, sir. The personal glorification of Hutchinson. But he did protest the Stamp Act. A public show of protest. A political gesture only. I'll tell you, sir, for one perfume shilling from the king's own hand, this elegant Thomas Hutchinson of ours would sell the honor of the entire state of Massachusetts. The Hutchinson's arrogance is unbearable. Here, yes. But not in London. He struck through our streets, but he crawled before the king. In these times, there are only two causes. No man can bestride them both. The colony's freedom or the king's tyranny. Uh, Mr. Adams, about your cousin. John? John is an honest man. However, as a barrister, he has at different times appeared in the Boston court, sometimes pleading cases for the colonies, sometimes pleading cases for the crown, has he not? He has, and both with equal skill. You see, John and I look at things through different eyes. Occasionally, I think his vision is too limited, as he must think mine is too broad. John will fight for the right wherever he thinks he sees it. He'd plead for Satan himself in the court of heaven if he thought the cause was right. Town born, turn out! Town born! There it is. Yes? It's the beginning. What's beginning, Mr. Adams? Who knows? Mr. Adams, did the Sons of Liberty plan any organized resistance to the soldiers? This is not rebellion. Sir, your cousin John Adams says this activity in Boston tonight is dreadful in its significance and implications. It is. Well, whoever is behind it must certainly realize the weight of that responsibility. Free men are responsible for these demonstrations, sir. Freedom is always a heavy responsibility. You have trouble with the Sons of Liberty. Dick Joy has moved to a new position on King Street near the Custom House. Come in, Dick Joy. <laughs> This is Dick Joy. You can see a crowd has gathered outside the Custom House on King Street, focusing its attention on the only English soldier in sight, the man inside that sentry box. Thank <laughs> you. 
soldiers are in sight, this spectacle is being observed from Murray's barracks across the way where the attachment of British troops is quartered. Cleet Roberts is now set up in Murray's barracks. We take you to Cleet Roberts. This is Cleet Roberts. The small detachment of the main guard quartered here is under the command of the officer you see standing in the background, Captain Preston. Eyes in the window, all the billies. Yes, sir. That away, come on. Pressing the sentry box closer, sir. Throwing rubbish and stuff. If I was Montgomery in there, I'd throw my... Billings. Report only what you see. There you are. Snowballs at him and still he won't fire. Montgomery won't fire and neither will any of you if we go out there. If we go out there? I said if. Then Preston, we can't stand at a window watching a soldier of the king torn into bits by a mob of stinking mulhairs. God save us, why the... Billings! Sorry, sir. Keep a sharp eye out there, Billings. We go out when the first rider lays a hand on the sentry. Fix bandits. Yes, sir. Listen to me. All of you. No man under any circumstances will fire into the mob. Is that clear? Captain Preston, sir. You hear your orders, Billings? Yes. You want to help Montgomery? Get back to your window. Yes, sir. Captain, sir. The mob's moving in on him. Bobby Lack. We take you back to Dick Joy at the Custom House. This is Dick Joy again. Don't think any further comment from me is necessary. Save us, Captain Preston. 
Yes, Billy. God save us. March 5th, 1770. The Boston Massacre. A night, as John Adams said, dreadful in its significance and implications. For American blood was shed that night. And the Sons of Liberty saw it, and hundreds strong, they surged back into Boston Square, where five men lay in the snow before the Custom House. Four of the men were dead, the fifth was dying. At least two of the dead had names well known among the Sons of Liberty, Crispus Attucks and Sam Gray, the rope walker. Governor Hutchinson was cursed by name that night as he was led through the streets and taken into the State House and finally pushed out onto the State House balcony. He stood there looking down on the seething, roaring crowd, the angry, upturned faces. The crowd fell silent when he announced that Captain Preston would be arrested. And then the crowd's voice lifted in a great thunderous shout of approval when he promised that Captain Preston would be tried for murder. The night of the Boston Massacre, Governor Hutchinson promised the Sons of Liberty that Captain Preston would be tried in a Boston court for murder. There developed one difficulty in fulfilling the governor's promise. No one could find any Tory lawyer in town who was willing to defend Captain Preston. Finally, one young lawyer, not a Tory, said he was half willing. Young Josiah Quincy said he'd be glad to defend Captain Preston if John Adams would act with him. Sam Adams must have known his cousin John very well. He'd plead for Satan himself if he thought the cause was right. John Adams, with young Mr. Quincy, defended Captain Preston, and Captain Preston was acquitted. Nor did John Adams' reputation in the colonies suffer for defending a soldier of the king. Scarcely six years after the night blood was shed in the Boston Massacre, John Adams was appointed one of a committee of five men in Philadelphia to compose and prepare for submission to the Colonial Congress a Declaration of Independence. March 5th. 1770, the day of the Boston Massacre. What sort of a day was it? A day like all days, filled with those events that alter and illuminate our time. And you were there. <laughs>